I'm here with uh, super collector John O'Quinn. John, you've taken home a lot of trophies today and uh, won a lot of awards and brought some beautiful cars, but I'm curious, what is your personal favorite of everything that you brought? Well, the cars I brought, the... Uh Oh, wow, my personal favorite. Well, the Stutz is, is a, probably a personal favorite, but also the, uh, the, um, the Mercedes um, SSK, that's a personal favorite. That's a great car. And um, so, and I saw the two. I saw that you brought a local Houston car. I understand that you bought the uh, brought the Rolls Royce that was originally owned by Howard Hughes, and you've restored that car and brought it back to Houston. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That's a very good story. Yes, I can. I, I get catalogs all the time, uh, Greg. From the company is going to put on auction. I got one from Hershey, and I saw in the catalog it, it's a featured car. Uh, statement and a picture that said this car used to belong to Howard Hughes. My immediate thought was this car belongs to Houston. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Howard Hughes is a Houston boy. That's right. And so I said I got to go to that auction and buy this car and bring it back to Houston. Well, I did buy the car and actually it was uh, the the restoration very badly. It's been sitting in a warehouse for like 60 or 70 years. And so uh, I heard uh, the number one uh, Silver Ghost restore in the country, Mordowski of the Wisconsin, and uh, he did the job, he restored it, and uh, it looks really great now, and uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Hughes picked black on black, so it's uh, it's kind of sterile since it's black on black, but I asked that it be restored exactly like it was when Mr. Hughes owned it. And that's also kind of interesting in Houston to pick a black car in the weather that we have here in Houston. You know, isn't it? With the hot weather, of course, I, Howard Hughes is not here, but we found, somebody told me the auction that the man who actually sold this car, the salesman, was still alive. I said, that is bunk. There's no way the man can be alive. Howard Hughes has been dead for 10 years or more, and he was already in his 80s. It turned out we found the man. We have oral history now, the videotape. The guy was on his first day of the job, and Howard Hughes walked in the dealership, the Packard dealership. The only way you could buy Rolls Royce in Houston at that time was to go to Packard. And Howard Hughes saw him across the way and said, Hey boy, I want to buy a car. And he got to work out the transaction selling. He remembers that event just like it happened yesterday. Well, that's got to be everybody's dream customer. I can't imagine being your first day on the job and Howard Hughes walks in <laughs> wanting to buy a Rolls Royce from you. <laughs> got to understand, Howard was in blue jeans and t-shirt that time. He was a junior at Rice University. His father had just died of an unexpected heart attack. His father was the man that invented the huge drill bit, the number one drill bit in the whole world. And his mother told Howard, Howard, you got to drop out of Rice. you got to come back and run the company. He and said, boy, did he ever run it. He said, yes, ma'am. He always said, yes, ma'am, to his mother. And he came back and ran the Hughes Tool Company very well. Of course, Howard's true love was aviation. So he left the tools, Hughes uh, Tool Company when it got running really well. And he went off and started his aviation companies, like Hughes Aircraft and things like that. Well, as a uh, local Texas boy and someone that was born in the oil patch, I'm real glad to see you brought this thing home. Well, I am too. And the other people have told me that. And it's going to be in the museum in Houston now. And that's where it ought to be. Can you tell us a little bit about your plans for your museum? Yes, uh, we have plans to build a museum. Uh, we're trying to find the right piece of property. We found one downtown that would be good. We found one not downtown, more in the museum district that would be good, so we're debating that. And then uh, we want to build, as always for Houston, we want to build a perfect museum. So we're doing a lot of studying of what are the perfect museums of the world. And we want to plan the best museum we can. I would say the museum be open in about three years. That's fantastic. And you know, probably the legendary collector that everybody knows about is Bill Hara. And now you're being compared very much so to Bill Hara. How do you feel about that? I feel well about it. I never got to meet Mr. Hara, but from what I know about Mr. Hara, uh, I like the fact of being compared to him. He's a real innovator. Uh, of course, he started off in the gambling business. Nothing wrong with that. And he thought the way to attract people to his business was to have the world's greatest cars at his place in, in Reno. And, uh, and he did collect the best collection of the cars at that time in the whole world, back in the early 50s. And uh, I have a number of cars from that collection, so do a lot of other collectors. And uh, he had great taste in cars, and he, and he restored his cars. He, he had a, a whole crew of people who did restoration to make the cars uh, like they were when they were originally made, rather than junkers out of barns somewhere. So I give a lot of credit to Mr. Hare for 
having advanced the whole uh, activity of car collecting. And I'm happy to be compared to Mr. Harrell. Well, you know, we're, as I said, we're so glad to have your collection here in Houston. I've been fortunate enough to see your collection on a couple of different occasions. And I'm wondering, is there any particular philosophy or anything particular you look for in a car? Or you just buy what appeals to you? Well, it, a lot of it is buying what appeals to you, but we do have a philosophy. Our philosophy is to have some of everything. If you're going to have a museum, you ought to be able to show every different type. Then we got more modern cars uh, up in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and some in the 80s. And uh, so consequently, we have something of everything. And uh, we think that's going to be best because uh, we won't show all the cars at once. The way, the proper way to run a museum, as I've learned, is a museum might have hundreds and hundreds of cars in storage. And they pull out a certain group of cars and feature them for a month or two. And then they rotate to feature something else. And we'll be able to feature most anything, but particularly about borrowing from other museums uh, that we'll, we can work with. Uh, some of their great cars from whatever era we're trying to display or whatever type of car we're trying to display and we'll be able to sh have a show in Houston on the best of the best. Not just because we own a lot of the best of the best, but because we can borrow the best of the best from other museums and uh, that's the way to do it, I think. Absolutely. And I understand you're quite taken with Duesenbergs and probably have one of the best, if not the best, collection in the world. But I've also been told there's an interesting story that involves Duesenbergs and your father. Can you share that with us? Yes, I'd be happy to. My father's uh, line of work was he was a master mechanic who ended up owning his own independent garage. And uh, it was a pretty good size independent garage. My father knew a lot about cars and about repairing them. He also believed in the work ethic for young young boys. So from the time I was 10 years old till I graduated from high school and went off to college, I worked every day he was open and school was not open in the afternoons and on Saturdays. So you come by this car thing naturally? Amen. My dad took me to see the car show that traveled around the country when it was arrived in Houston when I was 10 years old. That was the first time I'd ever gone. He showed me that he went by around the new cars. He asked questions that he would want to know what were new about the new cars. And he would then look at that and he would talk to me about it. And then we got to the old cars. And they were all set out on a green, big carpet, uh, surrounded by velvet rope and, and brass uh, stanchions. So I, as a child, I could tell something was special about what we were going to look at. My dad walked in between the opening in that rope, and my father was like he had gone into church. His whole demeanor changed. So he knew something special, a special mechanical when he saw it. Right. And so me as a child, playing off my father's feelings, I knew now this is going to be special. He would look at a car for a while, and he would point things out. Oh, son, this is a V16 Cadillac. What's special about that? It's the biggest motor ever made for a car. And uh, Cadillac made that kind of motor for a while. And then he got to a car he spent more time with than he had with any other car. And then he said, son, come over here. Look very carefully. He had the bonnet open. The Lycoming engine was beautiful, just sitting there. Gleaming like new jewelry. He was gleaming like brand new jewelry. He said, son, look at this car very carefully. This is the greatest car that was ever built. It's called a Duesenberg. I never forgot his telling me that. And, and certainly you have uh, probably, as I said, the, the best collection of Duesenbergs in the world. Uh, I'm told I have the, the largest collection of matching numbered Duesenbergs, where the just it was made, just it still is just the way it was made at the factory, the same body, the same motor, the same chassis, and so in that area I've got about 30 Duesenberg. Well, and they're quite spectacular. They are quite spectacular because a lot of them are made one off. Uh, the customers would want special bodies. A lot of them are movie stars, for example. We just bought the, uh, the which car are we buy, sweetheart? Which one, baby? The movie star car. Tyrone Powers. We just bought the Tyrone Power Duesenberg, for example. We have others, too. And uh, so a lot of them are very unique in the way the body was made. They're one of a kind as far as the body is concerned. And, uh, and they're just fantastic looking. And uh, they're great cars. And fantastic performance. Well, John, I want to thank you very much for speaking with us today and bringing all these spectacular cars and sharing with the public. You're very welcome, Greg. Good luck to you and what you're doing. Thank you, sir. Take care. 
This has been Greg Riley, live from the Keels and Wheels Concours at Seabrook, Texas, for GarageDeluxe.com, www.GarageDLX.com.